All right, tonight's topic, um, avoiding liability. Um, and the way I've kind of structured this is we'll start off talking about a couple of fun cases. I shouldn't say fun. Um, they're cases involving uh, associations becoming financially liable for a significant amount of damages. Um, near the end, in fact, probably the last third, we'll talk about insurance, which is probably one of the most important uh, things when it comes to liability and risk management, handling claims, and then we'll touch a little bit on dispute resolution, primarily mediation, arbitration, and litigation. Now, I do this with every uh, one of our evening uh, trainings, and that's some caveats, which is this. Um, some of you are in Washington, some of you are in Oregon, some of you are condos, some of you are non-condos. Um, the statutes governing all of these communities and the different jurisdictions have different requirements, and your governing documents are all different. Um, and so when Bruce and I um, are speaking, sometimes we'll sort of refer to statutory defaults. Um, and we do that with, with the understanding that uh, depending on what we're talking about, it's very possible your governing documents say something different and it's applicable. Um, in situations where we're talking about topics where the law is dramatically different in Oregon and Washington, we usually point that out. Tonight, there's not going to be much difference. At some point, and we've talked about this uh, for the last couple of months, we were probably gonna start mm -hmm. doing two of these a month. Mm -hmm. uh, one for uh, Washington oh, folks well and you. one yeah. for uh, Oregon folks. So with those caveats in mind, let me talk about a case. This is about two years old, uh, not in Oregon, different jurisdiction. Um, a tree branch on common property falls and hurts a young child. Now, what happened, though, is um, it wasn't just the tree branch broke. It was the evidence showed that... Um, the board of directors knew that there was a problem with this tree and that it was possible for this branch to fall and did nothing. So there's a lawsuit. And if you see that dollar figure at the bottom, it's a fair amount of money, $14 million jury verdict. Here's another one. Um, association had a play area in the common area with some playground equipment. Uh, the board got notification that uh, the swing set was subject to a consumer product recall. Um, the swing had also broken twice before, but the board refused to pay for a maintenance contract to make sure that the playground equipment was maintained and stayed in a safe condition. And a child gets hurt. $10 million in compensatory damages, $10 million in punitive damage. Bruce? Yes, Spend a second and explain what pun I always say punitive damages are punishment damages. Would you agree with that? Sounds right. Yeah. And I'd say punies are relatively rare. Um, but in this case, the, the jury certainly felt like the fact that the association had knowledge, especially with playground equipment, the children play on, they didn't like that. And so not only did they give compensatory, but punishment damages on top of that. Am I scaring all of you yet? Hopefully a little bit. Now, last case, um, this was uh, an association that had a large bike and pedestrian path that ran throughout the, the community. And a cyclist hit a, a bollard uh, and was severely injured, wheelchair bound after that. And the allegations um, su suggested that the board knew or should have known of this dangerous condition did nothing about it. And look at that jury verdict, um, 41 million. Kevin, what happens when uh, that jury verdict is larger than the, say the liability coverage? Bruce, that's an excellent question. And I'm gonna have you address that in about 20 minutes when we get to insurance. That is a good question though. Now, um, <laughs> here's a hypothetical. This is the first of three hypotheticals that I have. Okay, association, you have common property. Um, the landscaping is overgrown with weeds. And one night at a board meeting, a whole bunch of owners come to the board and say, hey, you know, we don't need to spend money and increase assessments for a um, landscaper, a professional license bonded landscaping contractor, let us do it. And it does involve power tools. 
what do you think? Should the board allow that? And I, I'm not sure I have an answer. I'm, I'm curious what folks think. I know um, there have been associations that we've that have done this, and we've made some recommendations. But uh, anyone, what do you think? Is this a, is this a potential liability pitfall? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, Mary. Thank you. See now, keep in mind when I ask questions, folks, they're not. I don't. They're not rhetorical. I, I'm hoping that some of you will unmute, pipe in, and, and share your opinion. Well, they are now, in the chat, chat box, Kevin. Oh, you know, you know what, me. Bruce? Thank you. I did not have those opened. Uh, so there we. Okay, now, and it looks like oh, and there's a Q and A. Um, let's take a look at that. Can you see the Q and A, Bruce? Yeah. Why don't you read it and then um, I'll let you address it. Uh, we have a resident who just purchased a Sprinter van. I believe it is a Sprinter crew van, seats five people. Our CCNRs under parking and prohibited vehicles prohibit commercial vehicles with writing on the outside. Vehicles primarily used designed for commercial. We have indicated we don't think this vehicle complies. We parked in our complex, except with the same three day limit as RVs. She said she will fight this decision. Oof. We're looking at it as a commercial vehicle. Can you advise us if we are correct? Um, you know, that's going to be a specific question, I think, related to particular dispute in a particular set of CCNRs, and it's probably um, not going to be something that we should answer here in this sort of public forum. It would be that is a good question. Uh, but yeah, sure. Let's talk about that offline. Um, now, some of you on this hypothetical in the chat said, no problem, no problem. Um, it could be. Um, one thing that we have done for some of our associations is said, okay, if owners want to volunteer, fine. They need to sign a, an indemnification and hold harmless agreement that says, okay, if I get hurt during the course of doing volunteer work, uh, I will hold harmless the association. Now, I don't know if that saves the day if someone gets hurt. Uh, Bruce, you, it looks like you have a thought on this. No, no, I'm sorry. No. Okay. All right. That's one hypothetical. And I've got a couple more in just a second. Now we'll come back to the indemnification and hold harmless concept in just a second. Now I am going to turn it over to Bruce for a few minutes to talk about one, fiduciary duties, what they are, and then in conjunction with that, the business judgment rule. Fiduciary duties are duties that... Um arise out of a special relationship, right? So where you've got uh, some ability to make decisions on behalf of another person or entity, and then you your duties there are essentially a duty of loyalty. Um, you know, directors have, I think, fiduciary duties towards their association, but not every duty is considered a fiduciary duty. Uh, I, I think generally I like to refer to director's duties more as statutory duties because they are defined specifically in the nonprofit corporation statutes. Bruce, before you continue, that reminds me uh, when we went to that law conference a couple of years ago, uh, one of the presenters talked about a case, I think it was on the East Coast, where the board in meeting minutes and in written documents kept referring to fiduciary duties. We have a fiduciary duty to maintain and keep the tennis courts clean, on and on. And the court said, well, one, those aren't really fiduciary duties, but the fact that you keep calling them fiduciary duties could give rise to liability. Do you remember that, Bruce? Yeah, that's, I, I'm not sure I understood the point he was making there. Yeah. But, um, I mean, ultimately, you're going to have your duties, whether they are fiduciary duties or they're defined by the governing documents or defined by the statute. I mean, ultimately, a duty is a duty. Yeah. You know, it, the, the board does have some fiduciary duties to take care of the funds of the association in an appropriate way. And, um, you know, but it'll have other, other sort of common law duties and other contractual duties and other statutory duties as well. Now, Bruce, on this next one, uh, I meant to include here uh, this concept of qualified immunity under most nonprofit um, acts. So if weave that in with the business judgment rule, would you? Well, <clears throat> the business judgment rule is simply a rule that says that courts um, are, are usually not going to wade into business decisions of a corporation. Uh, and so ultimately, um, uh, unless there's some element of fraud or bad faith, typically a court is going to defer 
to a board of directors business judgment. Um, uh, unless, you know, there's, it's interesting, there's, you know, there's a recent case in Oregon uh, about uh, architectural review control and uh, the standard that the court will apply in terms of reviewing an ARC decision. Um, and, you know, you know the, there was the older case, Valenti, which said that essentially absent uh, fraud or bad faith, the court's simply not going to wade into uh, those decisions. But the more recent opinion was that unless there's some other standard in the CCNRs themselves, then the court will apply that standard. So, Now, what about qualified immunity? Explain that. Qualified immunity is simply um, <clears throat> something that's applied under the Nonprofit Corporation Act that says that a director uh, will not be held personally liable for um, their acts as a director unless it was uh, grossly negligent or uh, willful misconduct, but uh, generally speaking, they're immune from negligence. Um, so now, what if they're compensated? What if they're being compensated? Does that, that still apply? Right. Yeah. So if they're if they're compensated, then they, then it doesn't apply. So the point here, folks, uh, there's a handful of associations where their documents authorize it, and some officers or directors of the association receive monetary compensation. There's one that uh, there's a discount in their assessments. That's fine if it's authorized under the governing documents, but keep in mind that that takes away qualified immunity because you're being compensated. Um, now, in terms of area, oops, areas of liability, uh, there's premises liability, safe or unsafe conditions, um, property damage, mold, water intrusion, breach of covenant or contract, uh, fair housing and discrimination claims are on the rise. Some associations have employees or personnel and there could be uh, workers' compensation claims or other employment-related claims. So depending on the type and size of the community, there could be additional areas of liability. Um, now, premises liability is this idea that you got to keep the place safe. Um, prop, by property damage, like I mentioned, it, water intrusion, mold, things that affect um, individual dwellings, particularly where the association has a maintenance responsibility for the exteriors. Um, now, fair housing, um, by that, um, we're talking about the Federal Fair Housing Act. Oregon and Washington both have state versions of fair housing acts. And um, those laws prohibit any form of discrimination in residential housing. And the federal law and the state laws apply to condo and uh, HOA boards. Uh, they also require, it also requires what are called reasonable accommodations. Now, the Fair Housing Act, um, if it's violated, there are significant consequences. Uh, the owner has a right to recover attorney fees. There's a right to, um, uh, to punitive damages. And in general, intent doesn't matter. You all hear that? Intent doesn't matter. If what the board said or what the board did has the effect of discriminating, there's potential liability under fair housing laws. Um, Bruce, how many fair housing issues would you say we deal with on an annual? I'd say it's it's becoming increasingly more common uh, for our, our HOA boards to come to us with fair housing issues, uh, at least in the last few years, it seems. Um, but I'm going to turn it back over to you, Bruce, just for a second to address what a reasonable accommodation is. Yeah, reasonable accommodation is the third rail of HOA governance. It's what you want to stay away from. Um, so the Fair Housing Act says that um, any owner um, that is disabled, as the Fair Housing Act defines disability, uh, can request a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification. So a reasonable accommodation is a relaxation of the rules or practices of the association. Um, uh, on account of disability and a reasonable modification would be a modification to the property um, on account of uh, disability. Um, now an owner is entitled to that uh, or a resident is entitled to that uh, when it is shown that the, the accommodation may be necessary to afford that person an equal opportunity to enjoy housing. 
And so what does that mean? Essentially, that means that um, there has to be some sort of nexus or relationship between the rule that they're asking to have an exception from and um, the symptoms of their disabilities. So somehow there has to be some benefit that would ameliorate their symptoms in some way. Uh, and it also has to show them to be reasonable. And reasonable is usually just a balancing, act, balancing test between the benefit for the disabled person and the uh, burden on the association. So it's a really complicated, sort of very factually intensive inquiry in terms of just figuring out when an owner is entitled to a reasonable accommodation. So if you if you get an owner asking for that and claiming that they need it on account of disability, you should definitely reach out to your attorney. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Bruce. Let's um, talk for a second about identifying risk, and then we're going to dive into insurance. Um, a lot of associations use different tools to identify risk. Sometimes it's owner surveys. Sometimes it's physical observational surveys of the property to identify hazards maybe on the on the pedestrian pass, maybe trees, that sort of thing, financial statements, records, files. Um, but one of the big ones is reliance on experts. Um, one of the things that's important about the business judgment rule is it's uh, the way I interpret it anyway, is if the issue is complicated, um, you have a, an obligation uh, to talk to experts to provide advice and you have you have a right to rely on that advice. And so generally when clients come to us and, and say they've got a particular issue, if it requires an expert, that's generally what we recommend. Um, and there's all sorts of different experts. When we have mold issues at condominiums, we, we recommend a mold expert to go in and do air sampling and determine the scope and the significance and whether the mold is toxic or could be harmful. We've had experts uh, look at a variety of different issues. Um, so don't be scared to rely on experts. Uh, granted, they do cost money, but in the long run, uh, it's generally worth that in terms of, of uh, reducing the association's liability, particularly where the expert has their own insurance. That's a way to shift liability. Um, you know, if, if there's a tree that is a potential hazard, hire a licensed arborist. If they do something wrong, they have their own errors and omissions insurance to cover uh, accidents or injuries. Um, I'm going to go to the next hypothetical, which is our segue into insurance. Um, let's say during a board meeting, owner stands up, they're angry, and they say, I'm going to sue you, board, and the association. Should you tell your insurance company about that at this point? And again, this is not rhetorical. I'm just curious what you all think. And here's why, here's why I'm bringing this up. No, no. Go ahead. Jo oh, Joel. Hi, Joel. What do you think? Hi there. I'd, I'd say do not tell them. Probably not. Uh, it probably doesn't constitute a claim under the policy. Lots of, pe lots of people get mad and upset and th say things. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. I agree. Uh, years ago, I was at a law conference for uh, HOA and condo lawyers, and the presenters were a group of insurance folks, adjusters, that sort of thing. And um, if you've ever looked at any insurance policy, doesn't matter what kind, your uh, DNO, your automobile, um, usually the first two or three pages say, here's everything we're going to cover. And then the next 50 pages are all of the exclusions to what they just said they're going to cover. Now, one of the exclusions under most policies is failure to timely notify the insurance carrier of a claim. Um, some of the cases I've read involving that exclusion, uh, they're usually pretty egregious. The association gets sued, served with a lawsuit, doesn't do anything, gets a judgment against them, and then says, uh-oh, insurance carrier, we have a problem. That's generally going to be grounds for the insurance carrier to deny coverage for failure to timely tender. Now, here's the follow-up. It's not an owner at a board meeting this time. It's the owner's lawyer. They send the board a letter and it includes a drafted, a draft of a lawsuit, but it's not filed yet. It says, you better do this or else this document that's attached, we're gonna file in court and sue you. What about then? Yes. Bruce, what do you think? 
Probably. I'd say probably you should notify your insurance carrier. Uh, it certainly is, is going to trigger coverage. Um, there may be some circumstances under which I'd say uh, maybe you can resolve this before you bring that to the insurance carrier. But what you should absolutely do is be mindful of the, the timeline that that triggers. Uh, so that's going to, you know, typically the policy is going to have a certain amount of time from when you get that written notice to when you have to notify the insurance carrier. So you certainly want to note that and not miss that date. Uh, but whether or not you want to immediately tender that to the insurance carrier is probably be a case-by-case -case analysis. Agreed. Um, actually, before we dive into specific insurance policies, um, Bruce, I'm going to turn it back to you again to talk just generally about a common claim against the board, which is negligence. And what 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 does negligence mean? Uh, negligence is an accident. Um, <laughs> yeah, Oregon and Washington have different different standards for what negligence is, um, but. Uh, generally speaking, it's an uh, unintentional um, act to either either act or 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 failure to act uh, that causes injury to another person. Is it person or property or property? Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to this concept of negligence in just a minute. Now I'm going to talk about insurance for a little bit, and again, um, adequate insurance with proper policy limits is probably the most important thing when it comes to avoiding liability. Now, the typical types, property, liability, directors and officers, I frequently say DNO, uh, and then fidelity, which is actually, I'm gonna give you all a quiz right now. I'm gonna give you a scenario. You all, you can either unmute and tell me or put it in the chat, okay? Um, a guest, of one of the uh, unit owners at your condominium is they just parked their car and they're uh, walking toward their friend's unit and the sidewalk is uneven. The board of directors has known about it. Maybe they didn't know about it. I don't know. They trip and fall and they're injured and they sue. Which insurance policy would be triggered? And again, this was Bruce, you can't answer. I'm looking in the chat. Li good, liability, 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 yes. Bruce, is this Natalie Wright, the Natalie Wright, the manager at Fieldstone? Yes. You're sharp, you're sharp, Natalie, good. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Okay, here's one. Um, board of Directors levies a special assessment and an owner sues. And they allege the board of directors under the CCNRs and bylaws did not have the authority to levy a special assessment without a vote of the owners and they file a lawsuit. Which insurance policy gets triggered? Natalie got it again. Yes, DNO. DNO, good. Okay, you're all very sharp. Okay, two more. You ready? Um, Electric fire in the clubhouse burns down the clubhouse. This is pretty obvious. Okay, this is a, that's property. Now the next one, uh, it's the last option, so you're probably going to know this. Uh, it's self-managed association, and the secretary, who was the sole signator on the association's uh, bank account and checks, for years has been writing herself small checks. But over the course of the years, it totals up to somewhere around $10,000. Board finds out they've been embezzled. Which insurance policy? Wait, is there something wrong with that? Bruce, <laughs> yes. Actually, you know, we have we had that very issue come up about four years ago. It wasn't checks. Um, the secretary had a, a debit card. She only used it for gasoline. About once every two or three months but over the course of 10 years and it did to, it was something in the ballpark of eight to, eight to ten thousand dollars fortunately the association did have fidelity insurance and they reimbursed them for those lost funds um i'm hoping most of you 
have a requirement or a rule or a resolution that says uh, every check cut by from the association's account must have two signatories. Any of you don't have that? If you do, don't admit it, but change that. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about some terms here. Um, in the insurance world, when you hear the word declaration, that doesn't mean declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions. The declaration page is usually one page, and it says, here are your policies, here's your carrier, here is your policy number, and here are your deductibles for each of those policies. Now, I bring this up because frequently when associations of ours get in trouble, the first thing we say is send us your insurance policy. And nine times out of 10, they send us the declaration page. That is not the policy, okay? The policy is uh, generally a document that's anywhere from 10 to up to 80 pages. Um, generally, no one ever reads it uh, unless there's a lawsuit and then your lawyer will typically read it. Um, but declaration page is not your policy. It's simply the declaration of your different policies, their premiums, the deductibles, and the policy limits. Now, an occurrence, that has a very unique term, uh, generally, in insurance policies. And uh, when it comes to some claims, uh, there is no insurance coverage unless there's an occurrence. Now, I'll give you some examples. Um, let's say townhome, condominium, whatever, in any event, the association has an obligation to maintain, repair, and replace the roofs. But over the years, there's been a slow leak um, and the leak has migrated into a couple of units in the attic and that sort of thing. That's not an occurrence. That's probably going to be excluded under the seepage uh, exclusion. Uh, so that's not an occurrence. An occurrence is something sudden, uh, a storm that blows the roof off, uh, a tree falling and damaging the roof. Those are occurrences. Um, now, every insurance carrier or the policy, there's two separate duties. The duty to defend you, hire and pay for a lawyer, and the duty to indemnify you, meaning that if a judgment is entered against you and the claim is covered, they have a duty to pay that judgment. Now, another term that you'll hear a lot is tender. Now, a lot of people, when I say tender, they think they're, I, I'm referring to, to my personality and my heart. I have a very tender heart, is what my mother tells me. I'm waiting to see if you're, la Joni, you thought you, you liked that one? <laughs> yes. By the way, Joni knows my mother. She's known her, how, how long have you known my mom? Since 2001. Quite a while. Yeah. Anyway, um, I got off track by telling you how tender I was. No, tender means <laughs> to notify to notify your insurance carrier of a claim. So failure to timely tender, which I said earlier, means you fail to tell your insurance carrier about a claim. So that's the, that's the term tender, notifying your carrier. Now, um, sometimes if a claim comes in, you might just be inclined to call up your local uh, state farm agent who your policy is through and, and let them know. And sometimes that will work. But I've seen situations where that happens and the agent doesn't actually tender it in accordance with the policy. So generally your policy is gonna have language in there that says, if you have a claim, you gotta fax it. Actually, Emma, uh, Emma's pretty young. So a fax machine, Emma, was this device uh, that you plugged into the phone line and you could send, I'm uh, just kidding. Do you actually know what, it, you've probably heard of a fax machine before. Yeah, I have, thank you. Okay. But anyway, uh, or it'll have a specific address that the claim, the tendering of the claim must be mailed to. So those are some terms. Um, now, before I go much further, I'm turning it back to Bruce to talk about this idea of indemnity uh, and particularly back to our volunteers want to um, perform some landscaping on common property. Accident, talk about indemnity for about 60 seconds. So indemnification is simply an agreement to pay um, uh, the liability of another person uh, or entity. So if it's in the case of insurance, the insurance company is indemnifying the association by agreeing to pay the association's liability in the event that it's liable under some lawsuit. Uh, when <clears throat> you're going to have volunteers 
what you can do is say that as a condition of them volunteering, you'd ask them to indemnify the association uh, in the event that they are injured. So they can sign an indemnity agreement that says that in the event that they're injured and the association, if they were to sue the association and association were held liable, that you know they would indemnify the association. So ultimately they end up paying their own damages. Um, we've also used indemnification agreements um, a lot when uh, with things like use of the common property. So if you have a pool, you have other sorts of common facilities where um, you know, there's a likelihood or a possibility of being injured, um, uh, some associations will ask owners to, to sign an indemnification agreement um, before being given access or sort of that their use is contingent upon indemnification. Indemnification and waiver are often confused a little bit. Uh, waiver is when somebody contractually agrees to waive their right to sue. Uh, indemnification is when one contractually agrees to pay to cover someone else's damages. So in the case of common property, we, you know, one thing that we would usually do is say that, you know, if it were a, you know, a father or a mother, they can indemnify the association um, for damages that might happen to their children. Uh, but they can't waive their children's rights. You see, you can only you can't waive someone else's right to sue. So a waiver is a little bit, sometimes a little less effective than an indemnification agreement. But usually, when we draft them, we'll include both. Beautiful. Thank you, Bruce. Um, now, one thing that comes up uh, is who's covered under these policies, particularly the DNO policy. Uh, generally, the board collectively, generally board members individually. What about the manager, Bruce? Let's say the association gets sued. So does the manager. Um, would the association's DNO policy potentially provide coverage for typically, something the manager did? Typically, yes, but you can also always add the manager as an additional insured in case it yeah. doesn't automatically. Good. You know what, Bruce? You know who I just saw is on here? Kevin Dorowski. Dorowski. Dorowski, if you're there, unmute and say hello. Hey, Kevin, how are you? Hey, buddy. Uh, you know what I've decided? Uh, I've never met a Kevin that I didn't really respect and like as a friend. Um, so anyway, and I'm guessing that's most of your experiences. There's probably never a Kevin that you've met that you didn't like. Absolutely true. Thank you. Good, good. Now, what about committee members, um, Bruce? Covered. Covered? Covered. Okay, last volunteers. Probably covered. You think so? Uh, you know, in the language of under the DNO policy, um, yeah, I think that, I, it's maybe some gray area. I think they, yeah. they often are like, specifically, but not always from what I've seen. But then there's usually some language in there that you could argue about. Yeah. To now, when it, when it comes to committee members, um, generally, Committees, especially committees created by the board, they shouldn't have decision making authority. They shouldn't be in a position to get it themselves sued. Um, but I also have also seen governing documents that authorize, say, an architectural review committee to make final and binding decisions. Uh, and so if an owner is upset about that, they might simply sue the ARC. Um, but generally, that's going to be covered under the same DNO policy as well. Now, I mentioned exclusions. Um, under the DNO policy, there's lots of exclusions. Uh, historically, uh, DNO policies had exclusions for if you get sued for fair housing violations. Uh, over the last few years, though, I've seen a lot of DNO, they actually do provide coverage if the association gets sued for housing discrimination or claims under the Fair Housing Act. Now, under property, and by that, I mean the association's property policy for property that's common or that the association has a, a maintenance obligation. There's usually an earth movement exclusion, governmental action. And get this, and it's in every one of your property policies, a war exclusion. Water damage, seepage is generally excluded, flood often. Um, wear and tear is usually excluded. 
And uh, so a lot of associations are, are, are surprised when an event happens, they, they tender it to their carrier and the carrier comes back and says, no, there's actually an exclusion. But again, um, most insurance policies, the bulk of the policy are the exclusions to what they're saying that they're going to cover. Now, in terms of the liability policy, um, Bruce made an important point uh, when he was talking about negligence. Negligence is what insurance covers. It's an accident. You didn't mean to. Uh, and that's true of almost every insurance, your, even your automobile policy. If Bruce sees me in the parking lot and he's upset at me and he hits the gas and <laughs> runs into my car, no insurance, I mean, that's an intentional act. Fraud, that's an intentional act. Here's one. And Ken, you can't answer this because I know you know the answer because I talk about this in my uh, real estate classes. What's the difference between a negligent action and a fraudulent action. And it's important because if it's fraudulent, it's not going to be covered. Intent. Yes. Was that you, Mary? Yes. Yeah. Mindset. Um, so fraud is, you know what you're about to say, or you know that the action you're about to take is wrong or untruthful and you do it anyway. That's fraud. Um, Liquor liability. Now you might think, why do I have liquor liability? Over the years, we've had a lot of associations that have annual picnics or potlucks or special events. And they ask us, hey, can we serve or let people have alcohol there? Terrible idea. However, uh, most of your insurance carriers, if you call them up, you can get a liquor writer. And when I say writer, I mean an additional insurance product. Um, and so, yes, if you're really intent on having some community event where alcohol is going to be served, there are some pretty strict requirements, but you can get special insurance to cover accidents or injuries involving events that involve where liquor is served. Um, Bruce? You know what's, what's another yes. common, common exclusion under liability policies that came up uh, a couple of years ago? Uh, is the virus exclusion. And, oh, yeah. Uh, so that was had a lot of associations on edge around COVID. And we had to do a lot of waiver and indemnification agreements for use of common areas. And yeah, so that reminds me years ago, uh, one of our condo clients, uh, there was a swimming pool and a hot tub as part of the common amenities. And um, one of the residents there, who was hot tubbing, it turned out he had Legionnaire's disease and it was transmitted. <laughs> and um, sure enough, uh, that was excluded under the insurance policy. Um, all right, enough on insurance for a moment. I'm gonna go into, okay, there's, a there's some liability there or there's a claim against the association that's been inserted. Where do you go from there? Uh, generally speaking, the first step uh, is mediation. And let me explain mediation for a moment. <clears throat> mediation is not binding, okay? A mediator has no authority to tell anyone what to do. All the mediator does is tries to facilitate an agreement between the parties. Now, if at the end of a mediation session, the parties say, okay, we've agreed to this, the mediator will uh, create a document and if you sign that, then you're bound by it. But the mediator can't make you sign anything. They can't make you agree to anything. Uh, and if, you know, an hour into the mediation, you recognize or realize that this isn't going to be productive, there's nothing preventing you from getting up and walking out. So mediation, again, non-binding. Um, but I'm also a huge advocate of mediation. Um, I've had situations where I was sure that because of the conflict uh, between the parties, no way the parties are going to come to a mutual agreement. And sure enough, after a long mediation day, there is an agreement. And I believe part of that is just basic psychology. There's something about a neutral third party mediator who says, hey, look at this issue. Here's some liability. Here are the risks. That does have an effect, especially where there's a clash of personalities between board members and the owner. Um, we have an association that is uh, just got sued uh, for the third time by the same owner. Um, is mediation going to be effective this next? Maybe, I don't know. But uh, my, my position is always oh. try it. The risk is low. The cost is relatively low. 
uh, and it's worth a shot. Uh, mediation can be expensive sometimes. Uh, mediators do charge money. And generally speaking, in, in HOA and condo cases, it's ideal to have a mediator that generally is a lawyer or retired lawyer that has some knowledge of legal issues, especially community association issues. Uh, a lot of mediators uh, are retired judges. And some of those mediators are very effective because they'll look at the parties and say, hey, from my perspective, if I was sitting there on the bench hearing this case, these are the issues that I see you have. One of the other reasons I really like mediation is you learn about the weaknesses of your own case. Uh, um, you know, you might think that the association has a really solid legal defense, and uh, sometimes it's helpful to have a, a third party mediator come and say, you know what, maybe this defense isn't as strong. So I, I always see mediation as a benefit. And because of the, the, the low <laughs> costs of that, always recommend attempting mediation to try to resolve the dispute. Now, arbitration, by that, um, some of your CCNRs or bylaws might have language in there that says, okay, uh, association and owner, if you can't resolve your dispute at mediation, you don't go to regular court, you go to final binding arbitration. Arbitration is just like a trial in some respects, except, except instead of a judge or jury, it's an arbitrator, usually a lawyer or a retired lawyer. But if your governing documents have language in there, and a lot of them do, um, arbitration is the final sort of venue to resolve disputes. And then by litigation, I mean just regular old, regular old court. In Washington, we call it superior court. In Oregon, we call it circuit court. Um, litigation is expensive, uh, especially if a case goes to trial. I mean, attorney fees could be upwards of six figures. That's why insurance is important. Now, earlier I mentioned uh, your insurance carrier has two obligations, duty to indemnify, duty to defend. And that duty to defend is very important because oftentimes the amount of the claim itself ends up being less than the attorney fees. If the association gets sued for 20,000 in damages and it goes to trial, the attorney fees could be 100,000 bucks. Um, and so that's why, again, insurance is very, very important. Now, one thing that we deal with and have been dealing with, especially recently, is um, lots of claims uh, against the same policy. And carriers have been upping uh, the amount of the deductible. In some cases, carriers have simply canceled coverage and the association has to go out and find new coverage. Bruce, I'm going to give it to you for about 60 seconds to talk about that issue. Well, it's a, an important issue to keep in mind. This is why I was, you know, early on, you were saying if you got this uh, letter with the draft lawsuit, would you tender it to the to the carrier? And that's one of the factors that I would I would think about. But ultimately, anytime you're actually going to face a lawsuit, if you really think someone's going to file a claim, you should definitely make sure you've got coverage because even if your risk is that you may have to go out to the secondary market and find more expensive coverage or that your deductible is going to go up, the, you know, the, the attorney fee exposure for that case that you're dealing with is going to be tens of thousands of dollars. And it's, it's almost always better to have that paid for by the insurance carrier. Yeah. Good. All right. A couple more slides. And then I, I like to leave about 10 minutes for Q and a, we're just gonna go through some tips. Um, for those of you in Oregon, uh, the statute authorizes you to adopt an insurance deductible resolution. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, this is particularly important in condominiums. Let's say there's a water leak, okay? No one, no one caused it, it was just an occurrence or an event. And the insurance comes in and fixes everything, but the deductible is $20,000. Oregon law says that the board can adopt a resolution and allocate that deductible to the owners versus having it being a common expense paid by all owners. Um, and I've seen different types of or styles of deductibles. Some say, okay, if the deductible is 20,000 and three units were damaged, we're going to take how much was spent of insurance proceeds for unit one, two, and three. And then on a pro rata basis, depending on the percentages, we'll divide the deductible up that way. Others I've seen, uh, 
just simply say, nope, each each owner that has uh, or takes gets the, the benefit of the association's insurance pays an equal share of the deductible, regardless of how much the policy paid to fix each unit. I also recommend reviewing your insurance coverage on an annual basis. Um, if you're an HOA and you have a clubhouse and a property policy and it has an insured value, but you just did a whole bunch of upgrades and now the value has increased significantly, you're going to want to let your insurance carrier know that the value has now increased. Um, and, and I particularly say that years ago, I had an association um, and the secretary who had been the secretary for, I think, 15 years moved and the renewal notices for insurance didn't get submitted. And there was a lapse in insurance, about two months worth. Uh, fortunately, they got coverage about a week before a lawsuit was filed. So there was coverage. But you never, ever, ever want a gap in insurance. Emma, I just saw you yawn out of the corner of my, of your, of my eye. Is this boring you? Nope, you didn't see that. OK, I thought I saw a yawn, but maybe it wasn't you. OK. That was me. Uh, it was you. Hey, Bruce. Um, rely on experts. Don't be afraid to spend a little money to have an expert get involved, particularly if that expert has their own insurance in the event that they're incorrect. Uh, regular property surveys, depending on the type of community, I think are a great idea. Uh, visual observations of trip hazards or other things that might cause damage to property or bodily injury. Um, one piece of advice that I always give folks when they ask how much insurance should I purchase, my answer, you want to know what my answer is? It's a lawyer answer. Here it is. As much as you can afford. And I mean that. Um, if, <laughs> well, Bruce, what do you think about that? Do you think you should go out and get an umbrella policy if your uh, association finances are not so good? Yeah, you got to you got to increase your dues. I, I, ultimately, you you have to evaluate you know the nature of your property, the, the 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 potential risk for injury based on the type of common property that you have. In, in the event that there is some liability, what's what's likely to be the amount of that liability? I mean, you know, if you have you know types, you know, you have something on your common property where if there's an accident, somebody might die. And you're going to want to make sure you've got a, a decent uh, size coverage in place, and you know for that worst case scenario, that's that's what insurance is for. And if if your finances aren't good, and you can't afford coverage for your type of common property, well, that's that's a problem, and you probably have to raise your dues. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, thank you, Elizabeth. Do you are, do you work in the insurance industry? She does. Uh, I figured I fi that that sounded like something from the insurance, someone that works in the insurance world. Well, we have about nine minutes for Q and A, so fire away. Unmute or put it in the chat box. Otherwise, we'll just keep rambling about whatever whatever you'd like to chat about. Mary, go ahead. On the um, liquor, uh, we have reopened the clubhouse for rentals again, for homeowners to have activities. And we have we have a clause in the rental agreement, no alcohol. We've been asked several times, especially in cases of weddings, if we would waive that, and we have not. Could the person renting the clubhouse get a uh, um, liquor? Yes. Coverage? Yeah, if they're willing willing to pay the cost of that liquor writer, and your policy has that, then yes, I don't see an issue with that, and pass that cost along to them. But again, uh, I would uh, alcohol serving uh, the liability when it comes to alcohol is is extreme. Uh, many yeah. of you may have heard this term, dram shop liability. There's a lot of liability for people who serve it. So most of the most insurance carriers, if they if if you can get a liquor uh, rider policy, one of the requirements is that you have uh, a, a server serve it who is licensed with the state oh, liquor board. Yeah, a bartender. So. Yeah, it's not cheap, uh, but frankly, I, I absolutely alcohol shouldn't be served unless you you have got that extra insurance and there's a, a bartender that has a, whatever required licensing is necessary. 
Great question. So pe wait, pe people get married at your HOA? Oh, yes. Um, we had these ponds, and in the summer, it's quite beautiful. No, that's great. And they, you know, they, they'll have these a ceremony out in front of the ponds and the fountain, and then they have the reception inside. <clears throat> Do you like to remind them that statistically, they'll probably be divorced in 2.4 years? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> After the... That is I'm kidding. Separate, I'm yeah. kidding. Other questions. All right, Kevin, Natalie asks, do oh. boards have to charter a committee in order for the committee members to be covered under the policy? Ooh. Bruce, what do you think? I, I asked the question. You <laughs> um, ideally, uh, most likely, yes. I'm not positive on that. That said, best practices, I always recommend if the board creates a committee, have a charter, something written that says, here's the purpose of it. Here's the scope of their authority. I think that's helpful um, down the road so that folks that are members of the committee know what their role is. Um, but yes, I, regardless of whether it's required for them for coverage or not, you should do it anyway because it's a best practice. Would you agree with that, Bruce? Well, I absolutely agree with that. I, I would think that if you had some committee that was organized uh, and for whatever reason now they've been accused of or, or somehow there's potential liability, um, you know, you'd have a fight with the insurance company if they said they weren't going to cover that. Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think he, but but um, I, I haven't heard of, a, of an insurance companies you know declining coverage on on the basis that there wasn't a committee charter. Gotcha. Um, oh, we got some good sure. questions. Uh, Richard asked, "Where can you get an insurance evaluation?" Um, I did say you should do it, review it annually. Uh, but in terms of wanting to make sure that you've got the insurance required under your governing documents or state law. Uh, generally a lawyer. Um, if you use a broker who specializes in community association insurance, they can generally help with the review. Uh, but generally look at your governing documents to see if there's provisions requiring certain policies, depending on your jurisdiction, the law might mandate you have certain policies. But I would say generally a lawyer or an insurance broker or agent who has a specialty in community association insurance. We just read it, our insurance, uh, Kevin, this is Joel. Hey, Joel. And we save a ton of money by going to a local agent. I don't yeah. know say the, the name of them. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big name company. We'd all recognize it. Yeah. But, uh, well, our, uh, our policy went from uh, 17, almost $1,800 down to $1,000. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Um, shop without, around. Without, without any changes in the coverage itself? With the identical coverage. Wow. Interest. Good. Hmm. Bruce, this next one's for you. I have, okay. Uh, what's the board's liability when it comes to conflicts between neighbors? Nuisance complaint is filed. Board did not fine for the nuisance because of lack of evidence. Does the board have liability? That's a loaded question. Um, I guess the first place to look would be your governing documents themselves to see whether or not there's an affirmative duty to enforce the governing documents and also whether the action that was complained of actually violates the governing documents. Uh, most of the time, under the governing documents, the, the board has a discretionary authority to take enforcement action and not an affirmative duty, but that's not always the case. There are some documents that actually put uh, an affirmative duty to, to take enforcement actions. And so uh, that would be the first place to look at it. Uh, the second, I guess, thing to consider is um, under the Fair Housing Act, there's a concept of what's called third-party di discrimination. And in the event that uh, a member of the association is being harassed uh, uh, based on a protected class, uh, and complains of that to the association, the association can face liability for failing to step in and do anything about it. Uh, so in the in the event that uh, an owner is complaining um, about harassment of some sort from a, from another owner and is saying that it's based on you know race or nationality or gender or any other protected class, okay. uh, then um, uh, it's important to have your lawyer take a look at that. Good. 
Oh, what about owners volunteering to paint the interior of a building, indemnify or hire out? If you got the money, hire it out. But let's say you want to save some money. Uh, that's pretty low stakes, interior painting. Um, I would still have uh, any volunteer sign an indemnification agreement saying that if the paint spills and it hurts their toe, they're not going to sue you. It would still be recommended. You know, my dad could easily hurt himself trying to paint inside the house. Pull a muscle or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> fall off him. Fall. He, he would step on like a... a kind of an office chair to try to reach the ceiling and, <laughs> and the tip. <laughs> I, uh, now, Jennifer um, asks an interesting question. Uh, townhomes, and they're having inspections done. Normally, they don't. Uh, the inspector doesn't necessarily look at crawl space, spaces in attics, but what if they find damage? That is a very factually specific question, uh, and it's going to depend entirely on the what, what your governing documents say. Um, Sometimes governing documents will say association, you're obligated to maintain the roof, period. Does that mean the sheathing under the roof? Does it mean the insulation underneath the, the sheathing? Sometimes it, it takes a, just an analysis of, the gov of your governing documents to make that determination. Uh, but if water damage is found, uh, again, the question depends. Wh how did the water damage occur? Was it something the board knew about and failed to maintain or address? Was it because of a storm? Was it because the owner did something uh, that um, increased the, the damage? So again, that's a tough question and it's gonna depend entirely on your governing documents. Roberta asks, we have a shared well and the well house needs maintenance. Every month we talked about owners volunteering their time to paint, re-roof, and there's an electrical issue. We have one owner who is a licensed electrical in, uh, electrician. Can he do the electrical work? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, first, you should never have uh, volunteers do electrical stuff. That's that's just dangerous. But in this case, the owner is a licensed electrician. Um, I'm going to think about this. My initial reaction is, assuming he's licensed, insured, and bonded, even if he's not receiving compensation, uh, his, his liability policy most likely would provide coverage because he's doing electrical work, which is in this, within the scope of what he does or she does, and covered under the policy. Um, that's, a, that's his liability policy. Is that going to cover him for personal injury? Um, yeah, so it sparks. Yeah, so the, his liability policy would cover bodily injury and property damage. To, to um, himself, usually it would be the liability. Oh, not to himself. Damage. Yeah, could he sue the? Uh, here's what I would do. I would probably enter into a contract with his standard, his or her standard contract, and for the contract amount, put zero. But you have a formal agreement that shifts the liability back. Oh, okay, that's what I would do. Yeah, the, the big issue has been that. He is licensed, but through his company, and his company is not willing to do the work. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's a different scenario then. Um, that, that, that almost sounds risky. Just yeah, I agree. I, <laughs> I, I would hire that out. It might be a few hundred bucks. I don't know how much, but I think it's worth it. The risk is 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 significant. Okay, thanks. And listen, I know a lot of contractors and uh, con most contractors uh, say, no problem, I can do this, there's no risk. Uh, and I get I get why they say that, but from a legal perspective, too much of a risk in my opinion. And Someone next, asked, where, do you have- Where do you get boilerplate indemnification and waivers? And the answer is you don't. Um, waivers and indemnification agreements under Oregon law, especially, I'm not sure if Washington has the same or so, they have to be very clear and specific as to what rights you're waiving and what you are indemnifying for. I, I don't recommend templates for that. Agreed. Uh, Christy asks, if we, for, if we forbid alcohol use in the clubhouse, how do we enforce it? Um, I would say first, have, make sure it's in a written policy or rule and regulation that all of the owners have copies of. Perhaps post a notice at the entrance. Um, but in terms of actively monitoring it, do you have a duty to do that? Um, probably not. Do you have a duty to do something if a board member sees a violation of that? Most likely, yes. Um, trying to think, yeah, how do you enforce that? Um, what do you think, Bruce? 
I had breathalyzers for everyone. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Yeah, I would say if, if the board a board member uh, has knowledge that the rule is being, you have an obligation to do something and step in. But I don't think you have a duty to actively be monitoring for that unless there's reason to. Like you hear rumors that there's a whole bunch of people going to show up with alcohol. That's one thing. Um, but great questions. Yeah, someone said we could spend an entire. You're in luck. I think we do have uh, a summer coming up, isn't it? Yeah, let me pull up our next one next month. Oh, actually, next month is rules, regulations, oh, and boy. resolutions. Oh boy, that's my favorite. Uh, yeah, I know that is a good one, actually. Um, and let's see. And you know what? I thought, we, yeah, enforcing covenants right there, September twentieth. Sign up. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope uh, those of you that uh, if you if you're a repeat attendee that you enjoyed this. I saw one comment that said this was their first one and that they've enjoyed it, and I'm I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, we love doing these. Uh, we love talking about these issues. They're intellectually interesting to us. And uh, one thing we love is the questions from all of you. Uh, they they make us think about things differently and and we like to know what kinds of issues you all are dealing with so we we appreciate uh all of your questions and comments and feedback and with that please have a wonderful evening 